have. And that is what we were about during our whole discourse. The structure of being and the structure of having. And we see it very nicely in number chapter 4. where Jesus is the example of the structure or the attitude of being, and Satan is the symbol of the structure of having. According to our great psychoanalyst, Eric Fromm, whom we have mentioned already. Okay, so we start out with the story of temptation. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit, out into the wilderness. That is important. It's really the desert. And um, the desert, already for Abraham uh, and then for Moses, is a symbol of being, rather, because you don't have much in the desert. You have your tent, maybe, or what this Jewish people call the tabernacle. We just went to the Jewish synagogue here with my class, with about 50 Arabs I took there. And they had a good time. They took a picture together with the rabbi. They take it to Saudi Arabia and show it to the king. Yeah, that would be good. So, um, so this really? the desert. Um, of course, the uh, we have must not take abstractly this having and being. So that there is something being without any having, or that there is having without any being, because Abraham did have, of course, a tent, and he did have the camels and. Uh, he had food for the family and so on, so, and, uh, so that we don't take having too abstractly. So, nevertheless, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness <coughs> to be tempted by the devil. They fasted, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was not an ascetic. He participated in weddings and he ate well with people and so on. So, not like the Essenes who were another group who were ascetic people. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, after which he was very hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to turn into loaves. But he replied, Scripture says, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So this bread alone is the first temptation. That is high living standard. This is consumerism. And that is the having, the having uh, attitude and the having structure. I had a pastor who uh, um, preached on this during the war uh, between Nazi Germany and he took great risks because he interpreted not only the first temptation but then the other one on power and uh, criticized the government with it. The devil then took him to a holy city, to the holy city, that's Jerusalem, I made him stand on the parapet of the temple, though that is the temple which was built after the exile, after Cyrus took the, allowed the Jews to go back and even gave them the architects who he was a great Cyrus was a great Zoroastrian um, and uh, he uh, freed the slaves and he uh, reintroduced after he conquered um, Babylon without any bloodshed. Um, he opened up all the temples again of, uh, of uh, uh, Marduk and so on, and uh, uh, and so the, the temple of the Jews was always also was rebuilt again. So that is the temple, and 40 years later, the same temple will be destroyed by the Romans in the year 70, and then whatever was left of it in the year 134, which was the final blow, and um, and the, the same temple he. Uh, uh, it was not to be destroyed, really. The Romans never destroyed any sanctuaries. They were very, uh, very uh, intelligent in that. They took uh, some of the guards in, from Germania and Britannia and so on, they took with them and put them into the uh, uh, sanctuary in Rome, which is still there today. Uh, and there they gave sacrifices to them and uh, put holy smoke up and honored them and uh, they had a religion of utility. That means one did good things to the God so that they would protest, would protect the state. So the religion was in the service of the state. And that explains why the Jews and the Christians were then persecuted and tried by law in the courts, legitimately in Rome. Because if you did not sacrifice to the gods, then the gods would not protect 
Rome, and so you did something against Rome. <coughs> that was high treason. So the atheism of the Jews and the Christian was connected with their uh, with high treason, and that is why they were sentenced to death, um, completely uh, legitimately in in terms of Roman Roman laws. <coughs> the devil then took him to the holy city and made him stand on the parapet of the temple. So. What I want to really happen there in the year 70, the, the Roman army came through Lebanon because of rebellions in Palestine, insurrectionists like we had in Iraq and Afghanistan and so on. And uh, the, by accident, one of the flamethrowers uh, got stuck in the door, which was wooden, the temple door, and it started burning, and then the curtains started fire, caught, caught fire. And so the, the centurio, the uh, uh, leader of the army, himself took a bucket and they tried to ex extinguish the fire. They didn't want it to burn, but it uh, you know, burned further and further and they couldn't do it. So that was against, um, against Roman law, Roman, but it just happened, it was an accident. <laughs> now, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, <coughs> for scripture says, he will put you in his angel's charge and they will support you on their hands in case you hurt your foot against a stone. So uh, that means uh, uh, the Satan can quote the Bible. And uh, that happens very often that he quotes the Bible. It is Psalm 91 which he quotes. And the interesting thing is that the founder of the Frankfurt School, which we mentioned from and so on, he put on his gravestone, uh, the gravestone of his parents, the first verse of the Psalm 91. And then on his own grave he put the second verse, in you eternal one alone I trust. And it's quite ironical that the devil can use this as well. So um, like the same things like uh, uh, also our uh, friend, um, our <coughs> mystical theologian, uh, also was used by the Nazis and he was used by the socialists. So the holiest things can be used by good and by bad people. Uh, though it is ambiguous. So, nevertheless, Jesus then also quotes scripture. Scripture also says, you must not put the Lord your God to the test, and that is also a quotation um, of, um, where does it come from? Um, let's see, that is Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6.16, that's the last book of the Pentateuch, sixth last book of the uh, five books of Moses, which Moses did not write. Next, taking him to a very high mountain, the devil showed him all the kingdom of the world and their splendor. I will give you all these, he said, if you fall at my feet and worship me. Then Jesus replied, be off, Satan, for scripture says you must worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. By the way, so the first uh, temptation could be called the temptation of a uh, high living standard. The second one is God alone. That means that you uh, think of God, but you don't think of his laws which are at work in nature and in history. You want to have a direct relationship, and so what you then ask for are miracles, for instance, the suspension of the law of gravity. But the law of gravity, like the laws of, uh, which are in our marriage, which constitute our marriage, our civil society, not only man-made ones, uh, so God is transcendent, but he is also present, and one cannot simply cut him off from all the, uh, what he is doing, what he is doing in nature and what he is doing in history as well. Next, taking him to a very high mountain, the devil showed him all the kingdoms and so on, and that is of course power alone, so the living standard, God alone and power alone. Then the devil left him and angels appeared and looked after him. So. That is a wonderful uh, exemplification of uh, Jesus as the, uh, with the structure of being and Satan who represents, if it is now living standard of power or uh, miracles or so, is the one who represents <coughs> having. Uh, and this uh, um, uh, being thing is then uh, carried on. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, is also carried on then in the early community and so uh, th which also emphasizes this having structure <coughs> so we can go you know to 
the very beginning, we said already that, of course, um, Luke and Matthew are a little bit later, but they uh, are bound to uh, the source Q, which was another collection of sayings of Jesus and so on, and there is an earlier one and a later one, so we can go to, to the first layer and so on, so in terms of age, uh, or when it was said. And so the Acts show then long after Jesus was dead, <coughs> had, had died, there the, uh, uh, the community went on with, and there the Acts number, here it is, <coughs> the early Christian community, the community in Jerusalem, but in the meantime, there were communities in Alexandria and everywhere else, already around the Mediterranean. <coughs> These remained faithful, the people who followed Jesus, they remained faithful to the teaching of the apostles, so the brotherhood to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. The many miracles and signs worked through the apostles made a deep impression on everyone. The faithful all lived together and owned everything in common. That is what we call communism. They sold their goods and possessions and shared out the proceeds among themselves according to what each one needed. That is the principle from everybody according to his ability to everybody according to his need. And that is what President Obama quoted several times in terms of our tax laws. And then both parties during the, uh, uh, the, the uh, presidential campaign used that word not knowing A, that it comes from the Acts, and B, that it comes from Karl Marx, because he took it over and made it the basis of communism. They went as a body to the temple every day. That shows us it was before the year 70, because after the year 70 there was no temple anymore. So, um, and it also shows us that, uh, that the Christians <coughs> were a Jewish sect, and they remained part of Judaism until the year 100 or so, when uh, in Jaffa, uh, the, the, a rabbi, when Jerusalem was beleaguered, a rabbi made a deal with the Romans, and the Romans allowed him to go out to Jaffa and found a Jewish university. And from there, a wonderful tradition was then developed. But part of the Sanhedrin, the governmental uh, body, was also set there. Now the Sadducee priesthood, was annihilated, the Sadducees, but only the Pharisees survived, and the rabbi to whom we went there uh, last week, that was, uh, is, a, is a Pharisee, all rabbis are Pharisees, now the Sadducees are left. <laughs> so, um, in the temple every day, but met in their houses for the breaking of bread. They shared their food gladly and generously, they praised God and were looked up by, to by everyone. Day by day, the Lord added to their community those destined to be saved. So that is one report. <laughs> and to make sure that the being character was carried on, which Jesus had uh, founded and had lived, uh, here's another report, uh, two chapters later. <clears throat> the whole group of believers was united, heart and soul. No one claimed for his own use anything that he had as everything they owned was held in common. That is communism, and, and that is carried on then in the orders, uh, not only in the beggar orders, Dominicans and Franciscans and so on, but also the Benedictine order and all the many other orders, the Basileus order in the Orthodox Church as well. They all have the vow of poverty, and therefore all <coughs> communistic uh, communities. None of their members was ever the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus with great power, and they were all given great respect. So um, the, the, the resurrection, um, we know that the Jewish community does not believe in this. That means when there was a Messiah, and there were many messiahs in Judaism, when he was killed, that was a sign that he was not the Messiah. And the rabbi called that a false alarm. So Jesus was a false alarm. The idea, you know, that he was not really, he died but was resurrected, then continues. Otherwise, uh, nobody would have followed him anymore. Um, the idea that the Christian community lasted after the death of Jesus has something to do with his resurrection and with the ascension 
and with the Holy Spirit descending on the community and so on. So that is how uh, and usually because uh, uh, Sabbatai Sui was a messiah too and um, he uh, uh, converted to Islam. That was a horrible catastrophe. So uh, ten thousands of Jews at that time, at the end of the Middle Ages, converted to Catholicism. But others continued to, uh, to follow the apostate, an apostate messiah, a messiah who had given up faith. And um, the whole theory was developed uh, <laughs> then, particularly in Russia, among the Staretses, and uh, what was this fellow, that Staretz, who was close to the family of the Tsar there? Rasputin. Rasputin, yeah. Rasputin was one of them, and he taught that, namely, that in order to be saved, or the best way to get rid of sin was to sinning, was sinning. Sinning was the best way to, to get rid of sin. So the Staretzes, like Rasputin there, he slept with all the girls in the farms where he, where he walked by there, and, uh, and then also slept with some women of the nobility, which had something to do why they were very beastly, killed him, butchered him, he just didn't want to die, whatever they do, they poisoned him, then they shot him, and he still crawled around. So it was an um, unbelievable tragedy. They threw him in the river, too. Uh, they threw him in the river, yeah, and everything. He was sturdy, really sturdy. Do you have uh, papers for us to hmm? Oh, yeah, 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 all right. I'm sorry. Ah, yes, like of course. Can you share one? <coughs> Maybe you don't have to share one. Maybe I have two. Yeah, we need another one. You don't one have to be communist. No, you can, no, the other, you can, <laughs> no, the other paper last week I Everybody can have his private one, property. One of my friends wanted that one. Okay, yeah. very good. Well, I have another one here. You can give it to your friend. No, I have to give one to Father Ken there. <coughs> that he learned something, too, in the whole process. <laughs> Okay, so none of their members ever want, ever in want, so this is from everybody to everybody, as all those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money from them. So we have already money, of course, we have, uh, we have uh, the Roman society had already a civil society between family and state, and they had uh, exchange, it was a commodity society, but on a much lower level than we. So we are the most extreme, highest level, probably, of commodity exchange which one can ever reach. So, but it was, it was already, money was there, so they sold their stuff and to present it to the apostles. It was then distributed to any members who <coughs> might be in need. So that is always the principle, from everybody to everybody. Now, when something happens, of course, Father Ken would say, as all the established churches say, well, that was a very idealistic picture, of course, and, um, well, but it is there, idealism or not. But um, one sees that sometimes it didn't work out so well, and there's the story there of Ananias and Sapphira, um, and so we know the story. There was another man, there was another man, however, called Ananias, he and his wife, Sapphira, agreed to sell a property, but with his wife's con Nibans, uh, he kept back part of the proceeds, so the communism didn't work so well there, and brought uh, the rest and brought the rest and presented it to the apostles. Ananias, Peter said, "How can Satan have so possessed you? That means how could you be such a having personality, such a having structure? How can Satan have so possessed you that you should lie to the Holy Spirit?" and keep back part of the money from the land while you still owned the land. Wasn't it used to keep? So it was somewhat voluntary communism, right? So he was not forced to sell, but the whole thing was voluntary. Uh, it was, you, had a, you could keep it back part of the money from the land while you still owned the land with, uh, wasn't it used to keep? And after you had sold it, wasn't the money used to do with as you liked? What put this scheme into your mind? It is not to men that you have lied, but to God. When he heard this, Ananias fell down dead. He got a heart attack. This made a profound impression on everyone present. The younger men got up, wrapped the body in a sheet, carried it out, and buried it. So that shows us something about this early communism. That means... Uh, Sometimes people couldn't make it to the being structure and retain too much of the having structure, and so some, something happened then. 
About three hours later, his wife came in, and knowing what had uh, taken place, <coughs> Peter challenged her, tell me, was this price you sold the land for? Was this the price? Yes, she said. That was the price. Peter then said, so you and your husband have agreed to put the spirit of the law to the test. What made you do it? Well, the having structure. You hear those footsteps? They have just been to bury your husband. They will carry out you too. Instantly she dropped dead at his feet, and so she another heart attack. When the young men came in, they found she was dead, and they carried her out and buried her by the side of her husband. This made a profound impression on the whole church and on all who heard it. <clears throat> by the way, there is a great man, Eugen Kogon, a Jew who converted to Catholicism, and <clears throat> he um, went to a Protestant meeting once, and they had this story there, and he said, well, that's not a joke, this whole thing. He was horribly upset that this happened, that, that they were punished like this, um, because that sounds already a little bit like the Inquisition, uh, something which we don't want to, to think of. So, But then, also this, um, they have just uh, been your husband, they will carry out you too, to you too. Uh, that is very often used when <coughs> people um, somehow want to bury somebody or say, this philosopher, this Schopenhauer, this Hegel or whatever uh, is a dead dog, then the, uh, sometimes people say to them, the people who will carry you out are at the door as well. So, um, that has become some kind of a standard, uh, standard story. <laughs> okay, so uh, that is what we wanted to look into in order to show how in the New Testament the having and the being structure are there. And, uh, <laughs> but it doesn't start out in the New Testament, right? We have it in the Hebrew Bible, and uh, I have written it down that you can carry it home. But used by the Jewish middle class, and that is important. Um, the Hebrew Bible is not so radical about this having and this being. That means it allows, it has nothing against wealth. It doesn't, doesn't think that wealth is, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, thievery or whatever, and uh, you can keep your wealth and so on. And the reason for that is we could say that who owed it? I mean, so middle class people are poverty people, and so the uh, Hebrew Bible is much milder than this. Jewish middle class described, nevertheless, the being attitude of Abraham and Moses. So um, Abraham uh, lived in Ur, and he was a rich man. The legend says that he made little gods, that he was in the god business. <laughs> and then he got that calling, and he left everything. That is this what the being person does. The being person leaves everything behind, but we know it's not everything. So he did take his family, and he took his camels, and his tent, and his food, and so on, and went toward the Canaan, toward the Mediterranean. So. <clears throat> that is one uh, wonderful symbol. All the stories about Abraham, about he has the promise of new land and uh, well, honey and milk and so on. So the first utopia. So he moves toward utopia, a utopia of being, but you have to leave behind the society of having and the psychological structure, the having structure in order to reach being. That is wonderfully presented in Abraham. <clears throat> and then we have it also in Moses. Moses also leads the people from having into being, into the desert, and again the land where milk and honey are flowing, the utopia. But if one wants to come to this uh, land of being, one has to leave behind what they had. Now uh, under Joseph we know the story of Abraham, and, and so it's under Joseph, uh, Joseph brought his father and his brothers to Egypt, and they were free <laughs> um, for for some time, but then the Pharaohs forgot about Joseph, and the Jewish people were, or the Hebrew people were, enslaved. So when Moses came about by 1400 or so, before Christ um, he had been educated at the Pharaoh's uh, court, and Moses is a Hebrew word, so Moses is a Hebrew name, it's not a Jewish name, and um, Freud has written about this a lot. <laughs> so, uh, in the book, Moses, uh, uh, the, uh, there we can find the whole story. Yeah, Moses about the in name. monotheism. Hmm? Mo yeah, Moses in monotheism. So, um, 
and uh, but then the, the, it had become their home. That is important now. And as slaves, they still they had houses and and they had family and, and so on. And um, the uh, Moses leads them out of that what had become their home. It was about four hundred years that they were there. So therefore, the symbolism is here again. You have to leave all what you have. You have to leave it behind in order to reach being. So having has to be left behind in order to reach the, um, the mode, the mode of being. <laughs> so, and, and of course Moses led them and they didn't like it. And they rebelled against that. So it may not be easy to leave them. And we see that uh, the struggle in the, in the Congress where nothing moves because one wants to protect the rich and the other one wants to protect the entitlements. So it's a class struggle going on and the class struggle is as a standstill and it's fought by two bourgeois parties. That means two having parties, that's an interesting thing. But one of these having parties, the also about liberalism, want to give a little bit to, for instance, one dollar more minimum wage and so on, to the 200 million, which is the working class, those who don't have anything. So it's really a struggle among the haves who struggle because some of the haves think they want to keep it all. The other one of the haves, the Democrats, think they want to share a little bit so that they don't shout down there. Otherwise they start screaming and maybe burn the city down. That's not so good. So they have to keep the 200 million quiet. Not because they are real being people, but because, uh, because they're smart and because they want to, uh, don't want to have any... Uh, that's uh, the emphasis on the middle class, which means people who are between those who have and those who have nothing. That means to have a little bit or have enough to think that they have something and belong to the half people and therefore, in spite of the fact that they are workers, vote for the Republican Party. That is the trick. As long as that works, we will have some stability. But we want to relate this to where we are, right, at the moment here in our society. The New Testament produced by the proletarian class, that means by the poor, so the, uh, Jesus does not belong to the middle class. Um, and you have a scholar who comes from the middle class here, he puts Jesus into the middle class. If you have a scholar who comes from the working class, he puts Jesus in the working class. But Jesus was, uh, the class belonged to the class who had no property. <laughs> that means he, um, they, they, were, they repaired the tools of the farmers. Uh, the Dechen says, you know, that Joseph uh, uh, put crosses together and that Jesus did that too. But that may be a legend. But we know about the class, uh, the lowest class you can think of, where those who had no plows or no animals and, and so on, but they, um, they repaired and they held, you know, held the, the tools in, in good state so that the others can, could work with them. So, uh, and so we, we can say that in the early church, the temptation story, the early church story, uh, Jesus himself represents this attitude of being and uh, therefore we have uh, this, all these stories, no rich man can enter the kingdom of God. That means those who cannot give up the having attitude cannot go over to the being attitude. And uh, it is not enough to commit the ten, to fulfill the Ten Commandments. There's a young rich man and he said, I have done all of this. Uh, and, and, uh, and Jesus says, you have to do one more thing, sell everything what you have. That is the, without that you cannot make the step into being. That means communism is the presupposition of the kingdom. And the guy who we uh, have as a patron saint here, Thomas More, wrote that in the Utopia. He makes it clear that communism is the presupposition of the kingdom of God. Now, all these Catholics hate communism. That's a strange thing. They will have a hard time to get over into uh, into being state, into the being state. <coughs> so, the um, uh, and, and many others don't, you, know, you cannot serve capital and, and, and God at the same time. <coughs> it means you cannot be a being person and at the same time a having person in the full sense of the word. But again, I want to emphasize, you know, that one does not, uh, it, it becomes untrue if you became, become, think of it abstractly. <coughs> that means when you think there is a being person who has absolutely nothing, because he has to eat something, he has to uh, clothing, etc. The most after Jesus, the most extreme saint, the greatest saint of the West is Thomas is Saint Francis, and we mentioned that already. Who throws the cloth to his father, everything, and stands naked there, and the bishop puts his pluviale around him to that he's a little bit protected on the marketplace, 
and we also have the story where he comes back from Spain <coughs> and he finds out in Assisi that his friends moved into a new house and uh, he gives them order right away to leave the house. Even the sick people, even the sick people, sick brothers, had to leave the house. So radical is the New Testament. And the sociological explanation is that they come from the lower stratum. And the Hebrew Bible comes from middle class people and they are not that radical about it. But radical or not, uh, one has, and they are also <coughs> having people, you know, if you know, having people, uh, it's, you can't, there is no upper class in Kalamazoo, but there is a little bit middle middle class, so up John's and Pfizer and so on would be middle middle class. Um, and if you can, they are hard to see too, they have their own country club and so on. But one could not deny completely that they also have a sense for uh, uh, for being in a certain sense. And they do not only give charity um, in order to image building and so on, they may also have a good feeling when they do that. As for once they did something right and it unburdens their conscience um, because they know very well that the having thing is the satanic one and that one should go to being and they do what they can their circumstances and nobody, Jesus forbids people to pass judgment on others, what they really do and how much they are being persons or are having persons. <coughs> okay, so that was an introduction for the day and we always promised ourselves to have a time diagnosis and um, we, uh, there are things of course, you know, the big robbery <laughs> of, of um, Precious stones there on the airport, I think it was in England, and so on. <coughs> perfect time over thing. Twelve Impressive. minutes it took, so these are super having people. They're specialists in the having business. <laughs> There's something going on like this all the time. So um, the, uh, the form, for instance, has no <coughs> doubt that uh, people after Jesus, and particularly in modern time, have chosen Satan and not Jesus. So um, a civil society. And that's something very specific. So, uh, the, the private property came about, of course, with the villages already. So people had their fields and that was their own. So 10,000 years ago, there was no private property before that. But 10,000 years ago, in the farms, so slowly that developed. And then it developed over into the cities. And with it came the just wars. War for your property. Most wars are thievery. Like Hitler's war against Russia was a thievery war, and the other one against the West was a revenge war. So it's revenge or thievery. Uh, so, <laughs> and um, that uh, uh, so this um, uh, this civil society then grew up in all these cities which the prophets talk about, like Nineveh or Babylon or Sodom and Gomorrah and so on. They had a king and they had a priest and they had families. But then there was already something between the families and the king and the priest in between. When you read Antigone, for instance, in the Greek uh, s s stories, then you would see she represented the family, and then there was the king who represented the state, and there's nothing in between yet. It's a conflict between the family and the king because the, uh, she had two brothers. One brother attacked the city, and one brother fought for the city. Um, she wanted to bury both. That is what the netherworld, the gods of the family of the netherworld, commanded to her. Both brothers were brothers and they had to be buried. The king, the state, says the one who fought against the state has to be eaten by the birds. The one who fought for the state, he can be, get a state burial here and so on. And then because Antigone obeys the gods of the netherworld, of the family, she is then buried alive and gets a death penalty for it. So there we have this, you know, that this was not always there. <laughs> but then as the, the civil society moves from the family, that means the family makes shoes and bread and so on, and then they produce more than the family <coughs> needs, and slowly they have a bread factory, and they have a, a food family, or, 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 or make blouse or whatever, clothing or whatever. That is how then industry develops. That's how a market develops, how money develops. And uh, so civil society then gets bigger and bigger, and that is where greed is. Look tonight at the movie American Greed. 
Um, they only show the less greedy ones, the real top greedy gangsters they don't even show. So, but you get a taste from, from the super greedy ones, so, by the little greedy ones. So, um, the, uh, and, and so the greed and the hanging on to property and making wars for property, for instance, to get rubber from Vietnam and to get coffee from El Salvador and get oil from Iraq and so on. That is when the killing took place and all was in the name of God or democracy or whatever. So that is that is the satanic type of a thing, which from, and I think they are somewhat right, that uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, this, uh, there's something with this having, uh, the, if it gets exaggerated, becomes extreme, it leads to madness and a Prozac, everybody's a Prozac. <coughs> and then, uh, of course, it destroys the individual psyche. It destroys the environment, of course, more today because of the increase of mechanization, atomization, and, and uh, uh, um, robotization, and so on. So and more and more, the nature is conquered and is made use of, and is destroyed. And the the having attitude toward nature destroys nature. The other one, the being attitude, would mean to talk with nature, to communicate, like Francis did. He preached to the birds and he said, brother, son, or sister, moon, and sister, death, even. He embraced death because it belongs to nature and so on. So that is, a, the, so in St. Francis, you have a being person, and in many of the saints. And on the other hand, you have the, this society, the civil society. It's not only ours, so it's not an American thing. It happened in England, and it happened in Germany, and, and, and so on. So it is an historical process in which this civil society comes up. Plato, you know, uh, uh, saw the horror of this having society, and he wanted to repress it. And uh, so he wrote this um, book there about the state, and uh, finally also about the laws, and um, he saw it for some time one could overcome that civil society, that having society, uh, by having guardians, and one didn't need laws. And then he became more pessimistic when he got older, and he needed laws. And when you have laws, you need the police. Have you ever thought that really the highest level of civil society is the police? And what would happen if one night we would not police this society? What would happen to this? Because the basis of civil society is the need and not only normal needs for food or whatever, the needs are multiplied, and then there are many artificial needs which we don't really need. And for this, we have to produce those commodities, and the producers split then in those who do not work and uh, appropriate the surplus value, and the others work and never get it. So those who, no matter how hard they work, they never get it, anything, and the others don't work anything, and they get more and more, and so on. So this is the hellish antagonism between the classes and the class struggle and so on. So in that sense, we read already something by Marx, and we don't have to repeat that anymore, uh, where he is on the being side. And what he criticized the bourgeoisie, why, he says to the bourgeoisie in London, why do you make a liar of him with every word you say? That means of this being person, Jesus, you damn it, having persons and so on. And then he, he goes on that called that in a book recently, you know, uh, the New Testament says this, what a being person is, and look what you do. You do the exact opposite what Paul said, the exact opposite what, and, and so forth. And then the bourgeoisie does the satanic thing and says, this Marx said, religion is opiate for the people, and so on. What he criticized was that these damned bourgeois have made religion into opiate, they have made out of a being religion a having religion and have ruined it completely. That means he stands in the tradition of the prophet of the Hebrew Bible and of the New Testament. And those gangsters who have used it to cover up their having blame him there for being an atheist or whatever. So perverse things can get. And then, you know, pay Hitler and Mussolini and so on to put all these bad communists into, into the... Uh, <laughs> into concentration camps and even march with three million men into Russia and kill 27 million communists and so on. That is the horror of the first and particularly the Second World War of Hitler and so on. Does anybody say something about it? He killed six million Jews too. And that is a horrible thing. And, but let's add to it 27 million. And they were, um, they were killed, the Jews were killed because they were responsible for equality 
for a redistribution of wealth. We are all equal before God and so on. No, says Hitler, Mussolini and Franco and Salazar, it must be like nature. In nature there's the predator and the prey, and the predator is that having guy, and the prey is eaten up. And what Hitler then did there was, look, I didn't make this world, I'm not responsible for it, but I want to make sure that I am a predator and that my nation is the nation of predators and my race is the predators and that we are not the prey. So I give you Germans this, the possibility to become predators like the British who have India, like the Americans who have Central America and South America and the Philippines and so on, and like the French and the, the, uh, the British who have all these colonies in Africa which are still blowing up. So um, that is what the struggle is. You see, it, it is all hidden. It is not there. And what we should do is at least to make us conscious. Enlightenment is to <laughs> make people aware so that ego is where it is. That is the enlightenment. And this enlightenment is going on in the Hebrew Bible and it's going on in the New Testament. And the bourgeoisie promised this enlightenment, but <laughs> then it was only enlightenment for the third estate, which is ruling now but not an enlightenment for the clergy and for the nobility, which they guillotined, and not enlightenment for the slaves and for the working class, for the 200 million. They just get one dollar more, uh, nine dollars, uh, the, 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 the guy, the, the CEO up there has three million, and the guy down there, he just gets one dollar more so that he has nine dollars. He can still not live, really, and get over the poverty line with nine, nine dollars, even if he works all day long and all night long. <coughs> so that is, and, and all that what we want to do is to, to clarify this as much as possible. <coughs> so, but um, I, I want to go back to this very shortly about what is going on because on Thursday the Pope will resign, right? And uh, it is a shocking event, and we read this article, and we want to don't want to go into it. But there are some things which have happened on top of this. Uh, two Italian newspapers uh, have discovered that on the day on which the Pope announced his retirement, that a document of 200 pages or so was before, put before him about a homosexual group of priests in the Vatican who were blackmailed by male prostitutes in the city. And that this was so overwhelming for the old man that he said, I couldn't, cannot go on anymore. And today another story came up. The Cardinal of uh, <coughs> um, London, uh, cannot go to um, to the conclave, and uh, Dustin told me he wants to resign. Even I, I didn't hear that, but uh, because he and his clergy have some homosexual things going on, and, and so on, so uh, which would just exaggerate this. So, but I think that this covers up what is really uh, um, really happening. And it covers up because of something which can call, be called the Pope mythology, where one mythologizes the Pope. It is not really his own fault. So that one calls him already Holy Father, which the New Testament forbids. Uh, don't call anybody Father. You have only one Father in heaven. And they go on. And, and, and uh, John Paul II, he said to a journalist, well, we have done it so long. <coughs> we can very well go on doing it. And so on. But it is not, not that the priest, it was the Enlightenment thing, or the priests uh, commit these frauds and lie to the people and so on. But it is also that the people need fathers, and uh, particularly as long as they are children, uh, or like children, as long as they haven't gone through the Enlightenment, the bourgeois Enlightenment, or, or, or the, uh, the Marxist Enlightenment, or the Freudian Enlightenment, then they are like children, and they want to trust the government and, and so on, and so they want to trust even more their church. It has also happened that, in a certain sense, the Church moved into the place of the Kingdom of God. The Church is not the Kingdom of God. Uh, theoretically, that was always clear, but practically, the Church did, for masses of people, move into that place. The Church cannot be the Kingdom of God. In the Kingdom of God, people will not die any longer, while well, they do die in the Church. And all the tears will be wiped off their faces and so on, while well, the Church cannot wipe off all the tears and the tears are always coming again, and so because of the suffering. So <coughs> the, this, um, all this works together so that the Pope, who may be a very honest and simple man, is nevertheless demyth is mythologized. <laughs> and the, the, 
bishop down there, then he, of course, has to carry that mythologization. So he talked about the great wisdom of the Pope and the great humility of the Pope, <coughs> and then blamed the loss of God of the modern world, um, which came a little bit closer to the, to the truth. That means it was not only that the old man may not all be having and satanic, but there may also be being going on and, and good things going on. And so, uh, in a certain sense, like all fundamentalists, not that he was a fundamentalist, but a little similar to it, uh, get into this hypocrisy that they, uh, on one side, condemn modernity and then they drive a car and they have electric light and they have a heating system. It's all modern. It's all modern. That's what modern people did. And so, on one side, to, uh, you know, to live for modernity, and on the other side, to condemn it, you know, is a strange type of a thing. So, <laughs> and it's not that he did not try, so he went to Berlin, and he was on the Green Party side, and he wanted to have the environment taken care of, and so on. <laughs> he quoted, you know, two people from the Frankfurt School, Horkheimer and Adorno, in one of his um, letters, encyclical letters, which, he, um, which popes never do. Another pope before, uh, in the Paul the Second, uh, Paul VI, he had an encyclical popularum, progressio popularum, where he even demanded uh, a revolution in, in the having civilization, if there was no other way. They, they quoted from and so, so <coughs> Yes. He also came out in support of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Okay, very good. Yes. That would be another example, right? So, uh, so. The, uh, also, the Paul, John Paul II, uh, on one side, he allowed himself to be made a figure in the counter-revolution, in the neoliberal counter-revolution, the third one, which was uh, successful, which was victorious, and he funneled money to the Solidarity Union, and he helped the, fall, the falling down of the communist government. But then he also, on the other hand, was critical of capitalism. The corporations went into Poland and everywhere and robbed everything and so on. So the Catholicism, the system is called solidarism, and it is opposed to socialism, and it's opposed to uh, liberalism as well. But then de facto, uh, they also were opposed to fascism, but then they did cooperate with fascism, and then they did cooperate with liberalism. And uh, what, what liberals and what uh, uh, Catholics and what fascists have in common is their unbelievable hate against, uh, against communism and socialism and so on. So uh, the, why did the Pope made a concordat with Hitler and with Mussolini and so on? Because they were afraid of communism or because they hated communism. As late as I think last year he visited uh, Cuba, and so right away he uh, hammered around against it, this evil, uh, evil communism, and now we have to go to liberalism and so on. And Castro and his brother, they, they treated him very well, and as if, they, as if he hadn't said anything and so on. <coughs> he also then said something against the American embargo <coughs> in the thing. So uh, there is a theoretical uh, willingness to move between two sides, but the practical thing is that they are then on the side of fascism, and the practical thing is that they are then on the side of liberalism, and so on. That means they never get that balance, which theoretically they have in their head. So, nevertheless, the catastrophe which has happened, and I think it is a catastrophe which has happened, is that scholasticism collapsed, and there was a vacuum. History does not allow for vacuums. The church, particularly the German clergy, tried to fill the vacuum by putting a patristic guy into it, and that has collapsed now too. That means he moved into a, uh, into a aporia, that means aporia means a, a dead end street. He moved to dead end street. It's not that the donkey couldn't carry the burden anymore. The burden was overwhelming because the paradigm in which he wanted to deal with modernity and the antagonism between the religious and the secular, um, it was not adequate any longer. So now that leaves us now in that is there a solution, uh, is there another paradigm available which the church could move to now? And that makes it a little bit difficult to think ahead is always more difficult. So 
There was a great Protestant thinker, Karl Barth. He said that the great philosopher, the uh, greatest one of the bourgeoisie, uh, Hegel, that he should have become the Thomas of Aquinas, or should become the Thomas of Aquinas of the Protestants. And I would almost have always added to it, he should also have become the Thomas of, new Thomas of Aquinas of the Catholics. There you have a modern thinker who is at the same time a Christian, and who has developed out of Christianity a new logic, a post-Aristotelian logic. Remember, Aristotelianism didn't work there with the scholastics, and uh, also Platonism didn't work with the patristic, with the church fathers anymore. <coughs> so then there is something, there is a philosophy in which Plato and Aristotle are superseded, in which the scholastics are superseded. That means, superseded means negated, but the best in them is also preserved. It has become, therefore, and also the Eastern thinkers, Taoism and, uh, and so on, have been included, and Islam has been included in, the, uh, in this philosophy as well. <coughs> he has written a, a whole philosophy of religion, a whole philosophy of law, a whole philosophy of nature, and so on. So that was the most overwhelming thing which the West has produced in modern time. And therefore there is a, a dialectical paradigm available which the Church should, uh, could accept. Karl Rahner, the great Catholic theologian, would not be thinkable without Hegel. Uh, Hans Küng would not be thinkable without Hegel. Even uh, the, the Metz, they're the father of the liberation theologians who uh, combined Marx and, uh, and Kierkegaard, Marx and Kierkegaard both would not be there without Hegel. And so Metz would not be without Hegel. So uh, the, that is what is available, that is what is providential. And it is not hanging the air because there are already all these Protestant and Catholic outstanding thinkers. I brought both of them here. I told you I brought Kung here. I brought Metz here. We did what we could to bring it here into the desert, you know. So um, the uh, and, and uh, other places as well, in Canada and so on. So, uh, but that is what one could work on. So it is not entirely desperate. Can the church be rescued? Yes, the church can be rescued. But we do have to move. We cannot move back to scholasticism. We cannot move back to patristic. We have to take a modern thinker, as Thomas did when he took Aris, uh, Averroes and so on. If Thomas could take the, the Muslim Averroes, then we could at least take a Christian thinker uh, who is on, on the top. Nobody who, uh, even those who hate Hegel for certain reasons and so on, nobody denies the greatness of his thought or whatever, even if they fight him. So, so, um, so that would be, and um, of course the Frankfurt School and Fromm and, and these people are not thinkable without Hegel. Uh, so uh, that is the suggestion. So we should always end as all the Psalms end. They may start with very pessimistically, but they end with hope. And there is this hope. Um, now, if this hope can be fulfilled, <laughs> that depends, you know, if there are more people who uh, will follow a Karl Rahner or Metz or King or whatever, or if they have suffered so much that nobody will follow them, but they all have students. And 144 of these students uh, presented to the Pope uh, um, reform uh, recommendations, and he had a secret meeting with them, but he did not, uh, okay, and he rejected everything. and. Uh, in order to get down to little things, you know, there are little things in, in things of a paradigm change. There are smaller things, you know, they are not getting to the substance really, they are much bigger things. The, uh, but for instance, uh, what the reform decree said was um, they wanted to have married and unmarried priests, both of them. And it was voluntary and so on. So that would be a thing. The, the church can do that, it's a church law, it's not based in the New Testament whatsoever. So, um, therefore, uh, no problem. As far as women ordination, there's nothing in the New Testament in what, what would be against women ordination and so on. Uh, there were women around Jesus and some played an important role in his life and so on. So, as a matter of fact, if you compare him with other founders of religion and so on, he was tremendously open toward women and tremendously compassionate and, and uh, not, not afraid of them. Because for holy people, women sometimes become the representation of nature. 
and they appear as a temptresses and, and so on. So nothing of this all in, in, in his talk. The, the uh, people were, uh, when, when Jesus talked with the Samaritan woman, they were not only amazed, you know, that he was um, talking with the Samaritan, they were amazed that he talked with a woman as well. So he broke uh, through all these culture barriers and so on. In group, out group, gender in group, out group, racial in group, out group, and so on. That is what a being person does. It breaks out through this. It doesn't mean anything for him. Would you mind commenting on how some of the more, uh, how some of the other religions focus on the man as dominant, not just in the family, yeah. but as leaders in the church, you know, not priests, but, you know, just yeah. the elders, and how only the men and only the yeah. men who are without sin or in good standing can yeah. be leaders in the church. Well, unfortunately, you know, all the presently existing world religions are all patriarchal. So in all of them, you know, the God has some male aspects to him. And uh, also there is, uh, you know, if, if it's the priests or if it is the um, Sufis or if the Kabbalists or even the mystics and so on, it's always, it's a male, there's a male dominance, you know. So um, therefore, um, you could say in a certain sense it was even worse in Protestantism, in Catholicism, it was a male priesthood, but they had married, so they made, there was a woman which sometimes was elevated into a goddess in South America, but uh, that was not done by the church, but she played an important role, so there was a, and there were uh, <coughs> women, you know, in the history of the church, Hildegard of Bingen, for instance, and others who uh, did stand up, you know, and, uh, but the only way how a woman could have an emancipated position was in the monastery, you know. So um, therefore there were some nuns, and, and even today, you know, the, uh, even with this little article downtown, there was the nuns here who were most excited about it. So the nuns were very often more progressive than, than the male partners and so on. But it is something which all these religions, uh, in Buddhism and Hinduism uh, uh, and so on, have in common. Um, so they all came about after the matriarchal period was over and um, the patriarchy was, uh, was established. And so since the Roman Catholic Church has that Roman element, the Athens element, and the Jerusalem element, in all three elements, it's all, all three <coughs> of them are patriarchal. Mm -hmm. And one would have to, even when we say we take that Hegel paradigm, Hegel was also a man and thought in terms of male thinking and so it is only today that you have um, in, in April there will be a, there will be a, an article will come out of Dustin and myself and Mike Art and so on, in a Harvard uh, journal there and there are two or three women in there the theologians who are feminists and are also religious people Schüssler uh, is one of them and another one from Canada from Toronto and also the one from uh, Toronto, um, um, the, she fought in the Toronto University, her shirt, her skirts were a little bit short, <laughs> and the Anglican priests, you know, wanted to throw her out for this, and she fought that through, and she won. She won the whole thing. And uh, so she, there are women who have a Hegelian background, who can think dialectically, and they have already gained ground, and so on. So, um, so this this is how the struggle will have to be have to be carried on, but um, we cannot go back to a matriarchal situation. The uh, um, when you read the the myth, in the myth reflects what has happened in society. So when you read Homer, you will see there's a Trojan war. Agamemnon goes there. He doesn't have any wind. What does he do? He sacrifices his daughter in order to get wind. Only in the patriarchal system you do this. So he is 10 years in Troy. During this time, uh, his wife, Gutemnester at home, she uh, established the matriarchal thing again. So after Greece was all patriarchal, suddenly it goes back to a matriarchal thing, which means men become then, you know, little lovers and so on. But the woman, uh, uh, the children don't have the name of the father. They have the name of the mother or the mother's brother or so. so 
all our children have the father's name and so on. So with my daughters, I always thought, why shouldn't they keep their name? Why, why do women have to keep their, have to give up their name and so on? See, it's all these little things. You can see how patriarchal we are. We have just a struggle on campus because women are not paid the same way like we are and so on. So, um, but the, um, so when you see them, then uh, the, the woman, you know, kills Agamemnon. He comes back here on a red carpet, that's where we get the red carpet from. He leads him on the red carpet to the bathtub and then slaughters him with her little lover. And then comes Orestes, comes home, and uh, with Electra, Electra, his sister, that's where the Electra complex comes from, and where the Oedipus complex comes from. So, um, and, and then the father and the sister together, they slaughter the mother. And then the Eurynes, the, the revenge spirit, female spirits now, are after Orestes. And he flees through this uh, whole uh, Greece and so on until he comes to Athens. And then in Athens, Athena makes peace between the genders. And the Erinys, uh, the revenge spirit, turn into Eumenides, into good spirits. And um, peace is made. But the, here, peace is made. That is the damn peace which you have now. The peace which they make is made by Athena, who jumped out of the head of Zeus, a man, as Eve came out of the side of Eve, these are male stories, through and through, see. It's not only God the Father, there is a male there, and so on. So it goes through the whole religious language. <coughs> and um, I, I taught the sisters of um, there in, in uh, Marinol many summers, and so on. And so some of them were very far ahead in their struggle and changed the language, and, and so on. They even celebrated the Mass, you know, which Rome calls a Missa Sica, a tri-mass, which had no validity, but they celebrated it anyway, and so on. And for them it had validity. So <coughs> that, uh, um, you know, this may be rebellious, and some of these things may not be very well thought through, but we have to learn to think it through. And the way is not going back to, uh, to Agamemnon, or going back to his wife who killed him or so, or to go back to Athena or to Eve or so, the question is if one can uh, resolve the battle of the sexes. Look, we have a trial going on where a woman killed her lover, you know. Then we have a trial going on in Africa where a man killed his lover and so on. So there is murdering going on, you know, all the time. That's the battle of the sexes, 6,000 or 7,000 years old. And it can only be resolved forward in terms of a partnership of the two sides. Uh, the, uh, if, if we would go back to any kind of matriarchal thing, when I taught a general modus here, uh, the um, men there, they, uh, the, the workers uh, wrote papers and I taught them and uh, they would tell the story and I said, you know, I came home one day and my wife said, I want to be emancipated. I told her, who emancipates me? <laughs> and so what happens is that the men, you know, don't take this and quietly they disappear and go to California and get a more domestic type of an Asian woman or something like that, or also from the Ukraine or something like that. So um, the, uh, it cannot be done. There are at least two million women in this country with a child or so, and then they have to go to university and, and get a job and, 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 and so on, and have to struggle with one per parent families and so on. And it's a very silent type of a war. So. It doesn't go that way, right? So and these things have to be thought through, you know, they are very complicated and one has to look at the history, how it happened and how can we can get out. We cannot go on with this patriarchal stuff. We cannot go back to the matriarchal stuff because the male population will torpedo it on all levels of consciousness and so on. So, so therefore we have to go forward in something which is called X, which has never existed before, see, but we, we have to, uh, we have to, and in marriage we also have that in our families there, uh, the families all emphasize solidarity, the family was dominant, the individual had to obey the family, you had to ask, you know, your parents and uh, you had to ask for a hand and so on. My son just had that on Christmas we were sitting together, his daughter uh, suddenly got engaged somewhere in another city and so on, and he did not ask my, my son. Uh, for, for her hand and so on. She told him that 
her father would like this and so on, but he didn't do it. Right? So either they don't ask at all anymore, or they just ask, but it doesn't matter, they would do it anyway, and, and so on and so on. So that means the whole shift has gone from solidarity to personal individuality, chemistry, you know, the chemistry does it and so on. And then that little chemistry has to carry a lot of wagons there, you know, and then after five years, after you've paid all that for the wedding, have uh, divorce, which you have to pay for it. So, so, um, so this, uh, that is all crisis mode, you know. So, we have to find a way in which we will uh, reconcile the old tradition, the old traditional solidarity, uh, with the modern autonomy. How one does that, it hasn't happened, right? But people who know the society well, and they know themselves well. The battle of the sexes could, before even the society will change, and it has to change, uh, could already still live a marriage and a family. Uh, it can be done. Uh, and I had a wonderful family. It was a little bit too short, as far as my wife is concerned. But um, people do that today. See, but it needs, uh, it needs a new level of consciousness that one can do this. And so, um, okay, now back to, to the church. So our conclusion about this time diagnosis was that there is um, a new paradigm available. Now, the only realistic element which I have to say now is that the recent <coughs> popes, two popes, uh, the first one, uh, John Paul II, uh, put uh, 118 or so cardinals, and uh, he uh, made 50 of them uh, uh, conservative, and his successor now, uh, Benedict, uh, made another 50, and so they're all conservative people. And these conservative people have been trained in scholasticism, and they're very old, and if they're a little bit younger, they have been trained in the patristic thing, and none of them is prepared to go over to a new paradigm. That is the fateful thing which we have. Uh, now, the Holy Spirit is working in the council, and is working in the conclave, and so something surprising could happen. Nobody knew that John the Twenty-Third, on Cali from Venice would suddenly call a, call a, a council. Um, that was a shock when he did this. He's, the other John the Twenty-Third had run away from council. Five hundred years later, he called the council, and so on. So, there are things which can happen, you know, but if we simply think, you know, in terms of our, our statisticians and so on, think quantitatively and so on, we must say that there is not a great chance that they will get, for instance, this African cardinal <coughs> who would talk about um, and would think in terms of the class thing, so that the church has to reform itself. The Roman bureaucracy has to reform itself in terms of the Gospels. It is, the, it is the Sermon on the Mount, it's not di diplomacy. The, the, B Benedict put up a new school of diplomacy in Castel Gandolfo. Um, if we had had the Sermon on the Mount instead of diplomacy, we could not have done worse with Benito Mussolini and, and Hitler and so on. So um, uh, that would have to be, and he would have a sense for this. He would not fight with the CIA against the, uh, against the liberation theologians and so on. He would be on the side, he would know that the church cannot be on the side of the having people. And uh, that this brings the church in contradiction to Jesus' teaching, and it becomes all then a lie. And to, to call those who fight against the lie, like Marx and so on, to call them liars, does not help the whole situation at all. So, now, the um, having structure, you know, is deeply inquired in all of us. We cannot be judgmental and say the other people and so on. So, um, uh, it is not so much, you know, that you have something and so on. It is more an attitude, how you have it. Um, you know, my, my daughter is, um, uh, is the, the director of about 200 uh, uh, nurses up there, and she has this thing, she goes to garage sales all the time, and so for years and years already, and, and she she cannot help herself, she has to go through these uh, garage sales and so on. And uh, so th that means she is struggling with this having uh, uh, culture and having thing there. 
and and uh, so I know how how hard that is, you know, to break anything like this. You know, um, it's not such super greediness or whatever. So, but we grow up, you know, the. Um, Wall Street friends who I have say, oh, why didn't any of your children become a professor and so on? I said, well, they want to have money, you know. They're having people in a having culture, you know. And the family is too weak, you know, to out... Not that I... We educated them as critical people and so on, but all what that does is that they have something without a good conscience. <laughs> but that is sad, too, you know. I mean, if you have it, you know, you should at least enjoy it with a good conscience or whatever, otherwise you ruin this life and the next, so that is not a good situation. So, nevertheless, we, we have to see that this, uh, I mean, Fromm was a psychoanalyst for 28 years, and he saw all these sick people in New York, and there's almost anybody who is still healthy left there in New York, so, and he worked hard, and, um, and uh, but, uh, it is difficult in terms of one's own personality, and it is even more difficult when you have civil society, as we call that. Now, maybe if people see how destructive it is, you know, this having attitude, uh, what it has done to the environment, you know, civil society to the environment, what it has done to our inner nature, our own psyche, and so on. So, uh, what it has done to our marriages, this unbelievable divorce rate and, and, uh, and, and uh, abortion rate, and so on. Um, what it does to itself in terms of the uh, crisis of uh, uh, finance capitalism, which we just had in 2008, and so on. And on Friday they may make another mistake there in, in terms of an austerity system that we would look like like Greece, you know. And um, in Italy they have just had an election <coughs> and they uh, rejected the austerity program which a, a businessman uh, president had imposed on the country and they, they just threw him out. So, um, and uh, there will be, if that goes through on Friday and they cannot settle it, it will be serious. Thing that means the economy, because of 2008, is too weak still. The unemployment rate is 8%, and with the blacks, 8, 9, 10, whatever percent, some states more than others, and so on. That's too high. According to neoliberalism, it should be down to 5%, and even according to normal people, even that is too high. But 8% is too high for everybody, and so um, this austerity program, which it will be, nobody thought that this should be put be into action. It, they made that up, that austerity thing there, in order to shock people and therefore to change. But now they enact it, or it remains enacted, or whatever. So that is a, a moment of crisis. So, uh, nevertheless, let's, let's close up with this, uh, um, uh, say with this time diagnosis, you know, in terms of the church. And uh, so what, what, we, what we say is, we hope, and this hope is not entirely unrealistic, that the Church will not fall back to the old paradigms, but will go to a third one in terms of the greatest thinker of modernity, and um, will develop him further. You could say, you know, what my friends Metz always says, you know, we combine Marx and Kierkegaard and, and something like that. But they were all Hegelians, so even when they fought against Hegel, they were still Hegelians, and something like that in this direction, because it's a new type of thinking. It's not A is A and B is B, but it's A is also B and C and so on. So it's a little bit more complicated that all things are identical, but they are also non-identical. How often do we see somebody who says, I did this, I didn't know who I was anymore, and I, 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 I lost myself or whatever, and, and so on. These trials which you can see every day whether there's a nice little person sitting there and she did a horrible thing, you know. So we are all split in ourselves, you know. We're identical, but we are non-identical as well. And so this is true for everything. And when you look dialectically at the church, the church is a holy place, but there are also satanic things happening in the church and so on. And both of it is true, you know. So when we say, you know, there's conflict in the church, then some people think you're not a good church person and so on. But the church was always had identity, but it was also always split in itself. As we saw, there, these people didn't want to give all their poverty and so on. So it's split from the very beginning. That is what dialectical thinking means, and that makes what history moves and so on. That's a new way of thinking. And we rejected Hegel in this country. We have a huge Hegel society here in this country, but 
in general, we ejected him because we thought this dialectic of thinking would destabilize the consciousness and the economy was already destabilized in 29, 39. And uh, so we didn't want to do that, so we rejected it. But I told you already, the price which we paid internally and particularly externally, the loss of the war in Vietnam and the loss in, of, against the Ba'ath Party in Iraq and in uh, Afghanistan and so on, in Pakistan, has something to do that our opponents think dialectically and our generals cannot do this. When they fought against the Nazis, they were two positivists on both sides. And then the bigger material will make it. But if you have a positivist on one side, like Westmoreland and General Giap on the other side, even the guy when he has less weapons and airplanes, he had no airplanes whatsoever and no fleet whatsoever. The Gulf of Tonkin thing was an attack by a fleet which didn't even exist. Johnson made it up. So um, the, uh, then he can still win. He can still win. I was in, in the Ukraine there and uh, accidentally I looked at the uh, maneuvers which Hitler did when he was on Stalingrad and so on. The man was crazy. He moved his units back and forth. And why did he do that? Because he had a dialectician as an opponent and he tried to react to him. So when, when, the, when the guy attacked, got, uh, took off attack, then he took his troops, you know, and put them all in one place. And suddenly there was no Shukov anymore. He had gone. So he took his troops out again, put them into the Caucasus in order to get the oil and so on. Well, then suddenly Shukov was attacked again in the back. When he had the troops all back in Stalingrad again, he was gone again. So this, uh, uh, it is, it's hopeless. And the Ba'ath Party had also been, uh, in, they are also in, in, in uh, Syria, uh, they, uh, they have been trained in this Russian way. And therefore with relatively small forces and a small amount of weapons and so on, they can still win because wars, as horrible as they are, they are not an animal affair. You know, believe it or not, there's thinking going on in wars, and the one who thinks better, he will make it. So therefore it has something to do with, as we say, with national security or whatever, to have a new way of thinking. But it's difficult for us as a culture, and it's also difficult for the church. <laughs> okay, so um, now this Having and uh, having and, and, and being there also plays a role, of course, not only in Judaism and Christianity, but also in Islam. Right? The, the, the um, pillar, the, one of the pillars, is to have to have to give to the poor, and um, so also Islam could uh, learn, uh, that too, could learn from the Hegelian paradigm, uh, because they have lost contact with their own Aristotelian tradition. And without the philosophical tradition, they cannot move fully into modernity, into post-modernity. We have seen it in Turkey, one can make that, but then in Turkey there are strong counter-fundamentalistic counter counter-forces at work now. And so um, it, is, it is helpful to all, uh, um, can it be helpful to other, to Islam as well. So, um, and they have in common, of course, with Christianity, Abraham and Moses, and also Jesus in a certain way, and even Mary. Islamic people think very highly of Mary, and if you deny the virgin birth, the Islamic students will be very rebellious if you do that. So, so we have, in a certain sense, we have those representatives of being structure. We have in all three religions, and there we can find common ground. Um, so. The, uh, the, the, the teaching on, you know, that you have to give to the poor and so on, uh, besides going to Mecca, the other pillars, and, and also a certain wisdom which shows, of course, that Islam is like Judaism. The Holy Quran has been written by, by middle-class people. Mohammed was a businessman, and um, so it is not so radical as Christianity is. So Mohammed would say, okay, give to the poor, but make sure that you don't become poor in the process. Well, that doesn't help very much, which is a very wise, I think, a very wise idea that you don't give so that you are then poor. No, that wouldn't, wouldn't help, really. <coughs> so uh, then, of course, the uh, be being attitude um, is then uh, is present in uh, uh, monasticism. We said that already, that, that is what they strive for. But the monasteries had problems, you know, when, they, when you have these being people, they can become very rich somehow, strangely enough. If you have 100 people living in communism, they make a prosperous thing. It happened in the kibbutzim too. And then when they get rich, then they get rotten. 
And so you have, uh, you have reforms, all these reform movements, you know, to get back to the rule and to get to the being thing again, because the having is growing and, and ruins the whole uh, monastic uh, way of living and so on and so on. Uh, it happened, the, the, uh, Dustin just talked about these monasteries in Bavaria make beer, and you know, they drank too much of that beer and so on, which then ruined the whole order, and then they need a reformer. Okay, so uh, let me just, yeah, uh, so we have a few, yeah, a few minutes there. I just wanted to, uh, at least, to give you some words of uh, uh, Eckhart now. <laughs> the, uh, the Pope has not taken back, neither as inquisitor, inquisitor, he has not rescinded, also as Pope, the condemnation of Eckhart, which is a very sad story. Eckhart meant much for, for Hegel, for his uh, dialectical method and so on, so there we have a problem there. And unfortunately, um, it did not happen. But uh, let, me just, let me just talk this Eckhart talk a little bit. Um, the most influential, and we said, you know, he, for 700 years he has influenced the most advanced spirits, uh, Jews, Muslims, Christians, and so on, uh, modern people. Um, and there is a sermon here by him which is called How a Radical Letting Go Becomes a True Letting Be. So that is our theme, that is what we wanted to talk about. It. And it starts from the how happy are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And there is the external poverty, of course, that you don't have money and so on. The, uh, Luke has that. Luke means the external poverty, but Matthew means the internal poverty. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. And uh, so uh, the um, Eckhart then, and let me just read that a little bit, uh, what, what it sounds like. Thus we say that a person must be so poor that he or she is no place and has no place wherein God could act. Where people still preserve some place in themselves, they preserve distinction. Distinction. This is why I pray God to rid me of God. Now, Eckhart has two gods. One is with a capital G and one is with a small one. When he has the small one, that means the creator God of the Hebrew Bible. When he talks with the big thing, then he means the Godhead. And so what we have in this uh, positive way and the negative way, the negative way or the cataphatic way, doesn't have a strange word, doesn't matter very much, um, the, this way is that he wants to get behind all distinctions not only class distinction, like a class, a class of society or whatever, but even the Trinity. That means he wants to go behind the Trinity because the Trinity means distinction. There's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So he moves even behind that Trinitarian distinction to the Godhead, absolute oneness. In this oneness there are no distinctions between created or uncreated, and so on. So that is what the text is about here. For my essential being is above God, in so far, that's with a little g, in so far as we consider God as the origin of creatures. So it is the, God, it's the creator God of chapter, Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Indeed, in God's own being, where God is raised above all being and all distinctions, there I was myself, there I willed myself, and I knew myself to create this person that I am. Therefore I am cause of myself according to my being, which is eternal, but not according to my becoming, which is temporal. Therefore also I am unborn, and following the way of my unborn being, I can never die. Following the way of my unborn being, I have always been, because there is no distinction. I am now and shall remain eternally, what I am by my temporal birth is destined to die and be annihilated, for it is mortal. Therefore, I must with time pass away. In my eternal birth, all things were born, and I was cause of myself and of all things. 
If I had willed it, neither I nor any things would have come to be. And if I myself were not, God would not be either. That God is God, of this I am the cause. If I were not, God would not be God. So these are very outrageous things where at the time and they are now. And he called that discoveries. And um, these discoveries were the reason why the Inquisition uh, condemned him. That means this is what is called, we can do that very shortly, what is called panentheism, all in one, panentheism, all in one. And what the Inquisition understood was pantheism, God is all. That means God is nature, like Spinoza and so on. And that can be also called materialism or it can be called atheism. And the Inquisition uh, rejected that. But it was rejected, uh, you know, against Spinoza and everybody else. Also by the Jewish community, they excommunicated Spinoza and, and so on. So, but this is the misunderstanding which in the meantime should have been settled. Now, as far as this oneness of God there, what does Eckhart say? Oh, the Divine One is a negation of negations. There you see the dialectics which Hegel inherited from him and so on. The Divine One is a negation of negations and a desire of desires. What does one mean? Something to which nothing is to be added. There is something in Mohammed where Mohammed is afraid that something may be added to the One. And the criticism of the Christology is that we, the Christians, added something to God, namely Christ, and that we overdid it, and, uh, and polytheism is the real charge then. Um, something to which nothing is to be added. The soul takes hold of the Godhead, that is this unity which is behind the distinction of the Trinity, where it is pure, where there is nothing beside it, nothing else to consider. The one is a negation of negations. Every creature contains a negation. One denies that it is the other. I am not this guy, I am an American, I am not a Russian, and so on. An angel denies that it is any other creature, but God contains the denial of denials. He is that one who denies of every other that it is anything except himself. So. We have that uh, same thinking also when the uh, when Horkheimer and Fromm and this Fromm talks about X experience, uh, the others talk about uh, the longing for the totally other, uh, or the longing for the truth. And what is the truth? The truth is the negation of the negativity of all the perils of human nature, that we are abandoned, <coughs> that we are lonely, that we are alienated that we are surrounded by horrible injustices, drones killing people continually, and so on. So that means the truth is the negation of this negativity that is, uh, that is thinking of, uh, of um, uh, um, the mystics. Then, uh, how should we then behave in terms of loving this God? And so Eckhart says, and I quote him again, how then shall I love him? this God, this absolute oneness beyond all distinctions, even the Trinitarian distinctions. You are to love God aspiritually. That is, your soul shall be aspiritual, devoid of ghost-likeness. For as long as the soul is ghost-like, it is a mental image, and being image-like, it will lack both unity and the power to unite. Thus, it could not love God rightly. So love is the power to unite what is opposite. So it is negates the negation of contradiction. Thus, it could not love God rightly, for true love is union. Your soul ought to be de-ghosted, void of ghosts, and be kept so. For if you love God as a God, with a small g, a ghost, a person, or if he were something with a form, you must get rid of all of that. God is formless. God is not a thing. The soul is not a thing. <laughs> How then shall I love him? Love him as he is a nut god, 
and not ghost, are personal, formless. Love him as he is the one, pure, sheer and limpid, in whom there is no duality, for we are to sink eternally from negation to negation into the one. So this is real theology, right? When, when somebody uh, says, you know, theology, uh, don't take it clear, now students laugh about it and so on, they don't know what they're talking about. There are residuals of that in Karl Rahner or in Karl, in the, uh, the parts and counterparts and so on. <coughs> but they have forgotten, you know, this is what like Benjamin said, um, hmm. theology has become small and ugly, the hunchback, you know, and which cannot let itself be seen in public any longer and so on. <coughs> so, but this is high-level type of theology and you see it's not very, very easy. 